So to start with word worksheet number two, uh, the first thing, I want to make sure everybody can see this ruler that's up here at the top on their screen. So usually that's turned off by default. To turn it on, you go to view right here, and then over here to ruler is right there on the kind of on the left. The part of this that I'm interested in everybody being able to see for sure is these tab stops over here on the left. And they do two things for us. First thing they do is they kind of show us what's going on on the page, but then they also allow us to change what's going on on the page. Let me show you what I mean. So this first paragraph, we are just going to indent the first line of the paragraph. Probably everybody's done this before you just put your cursor there and hit tab. But what I wanted to show you was see these tab stops up here that a lot of people don't usually see. That top one looks like upside down triangle, but it represents the first line indent. If you put your mouse over, it'll actually pop out. It'll say first line indent. Now, not only did that jump over to show you where your first line indent was for that particular paragraph, but if you grab it with your mouse, you can actually move that anywhere you want. So if you're not happy with the half inch default, you can change it just by clicking that and moving it. The next paragraph, this one down here, we're going to indent the entire paragraph. So every line in the paragraph. Now there's two ways to do that. Uh, that are both pretty easy. The first way is if you go to the home ribbon, in the paragraph section, top row right here, there are these two buttons, little blue arrow buttons. One is called increase indent. If you put your mouse over it, it'll tell you. And the other is decrease indent. So notice every time I click the increase indent button, it moves the paragraph in a half an inch. As soon as I click the decrease indent button, it moves it back a half an inch. Now, you'll also notice that all three tab stops jump to match. Wherever the whole paragraph is at, all three of those tab stops match it. If you are not happy with the half inch default, that's fine. To move all three of these at once, you just grab the bottom one. Looks like a little rectangle down there. And you can actually move all three of these at the same time, anywhere you really want them to go. That's the indenting the entire paragraph. Sometimes people call this a block quote indent, by the way, because when you're writing like a research paper, if you borrow a large quote, something, you know, like 40 words or more, you would present it in a block quote so that you're not, you know, faking like you made that up. So the third kind of indent is what they call a hanging indent. And most people don't even know this one exists. Okay, I've never heard of it. The fastest way to insert a hanging indent or to create a hanging indent is literally just to grab that middle tab stop that we haven't used yet. If you put your mouse over it just right, it should pop out and say hanging indent. That's how you know you're in the right place. You can just grab it, you can just move it wherever you want it to go. But notice what the hanging indent does. It leaves the first line of the paragraph kind of hanging out on the left margin. That's why they call it a hanging indent. And then it lines up the rest of the paragraph nice and neat. Now, this is mostly used for like references or bibliographies. But it is also could be pretty useful for like a resume where, you know, this paragraph out here, it could say something like, you know, work experience. And then in here, you could talk all about your work experience and have it lined up nice and neat. Or education and then you could talk all about the schools you went to and the education you got out there okay so it does have pretty interesting places it could be used but that's three kinds of indent the first line indent the full indent or the block quote indent and then the hanging indent all three of them can be created and manipulated with these tab stops up here at the top or another option which we didn't cover which you should still know about is if you open up the paragraphs dialog box, remember when we talked about the font dialog box, you know, to get like small caps and stuff? Well, the paragraph dialog box, same kind of deal. And in the middle right here is all about indenting your paragraph. See that? So if you open up the font dialog or the paragraph dialog box, 
um, you will have those sections in the middle there where you can set up all those different types of indentation. So there's that. Next, we are going to use the word processors find and replace function, which is kind of a cool function if you need it. A lot of people have never used it before, so it's pretty easy though. What we're going to do is in this paragraph, I have repeated black square over and over and over. We're going to have the computer find everywhere that says black square and we're going to replace that with white circle. And yes, I'm going to highlight the paragraph for this one because I don't want it to search outside of the paragraph really. I don't think it would hurt anything, uh, but I just want it to be more specific. So to get to the find and replace function, you go in your home ribbon, which is probably where you already are. Over on the very far right is a replace button. See that over there on the far right? Click that. So what do we want it to find? black square now be careful to spell it right because it will search for exactly what you type in there spell checker does not work in this window same goes for white circle right here okay if I however I type it in whether it's right or wrong it will do what it's told now you can click find next replace find next replace or you know if you want to skip one you can do find next find next but in this case we're just going to replace all and it will tell you 59 replacements were made do you want to search the rest of the document nope so here's why the spell check does not work inside that window let's say for instance that i wrote a report a research report on gandhi and i realized when i was done with the whole report that i had misspelled gandhi the entire time i could absolutely have the find and replace find the misspelled version and replace it with the properly spelled version with a couple of clicks. Okay, that's why find and replace is useful, why the spell checker doesn't work. But you got to be careful with it. Just watch this. Don't do this on your own screen, but watch this for a second. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss this. Here's where find and replace gets people in trouble. Okay, check this out. Let's say I decided to change the point of view from my paper from first person to like second person I wanted to say instead of I I wanted to say we and this is a lame example because you probably would never want to do this but watch what happens so I replace the word I with the word we see that now watch what happens when I replace all it made 302 replacements What did it do? Like literally, what did it do? What do you, what do you see there? Every, exactly, every single time an I was typed in this worksheet, whether it was in a word or outside of a word or its own word or wherever it was, it took that I out and replaced it with a W-E. You have got to be exceptionally careful with the find and replace function. Okay, because look what it did to my worksheet. Of course, remember, you can just undo. Now, the next part, we're going to mess with proofreading. And I'll zoom in a touch here. Okay, before we get rolling with this, I know that probably everybody in here is familiar with proofreading. Your phone does it, the computer does it. Uh, you have autocorrect and all kinds of stuff to quote unquote help you be better at writing what you mean. However, if you don't understand how it works, you either end up getting in arguments with your proofreader and your autocorrect makes a fool of you, which who, who hasn't that has that not ever happened to? Let's talk about actually what's going on here with the word processor, and I have to you have to stretch this knowledge to different places because I know we use these proofreading functions in a lot of different places like cell phones like computers like laptops like tablets like whatever right so there's three basic marks that you see in the on the fly as you type kind of proofreading function sometimes you'll see a green squiggly I'm talking about the squiggly line underneath the words right so the green squiggly, this particular word processor doesn't use green, but I know, I'm pretty sure that Google Docs does. So if you're typing in there, you're gonna see a green squiggly. That means it's trying to alert you 
to the fact that something might be wrong with grammar. Red squiggly, everybody thinks that means the word is misspelled, but that's not what it means. Close, but not exactly what it means. We'll talk about that in a second. And the blue squiggly, which this word processor uses blue squiggly for like a lot of stuff, but in general, the blue squiggly has been designed or created to tell you that you spelled the word correctly. It's not a red or, you know, it's not, but you used the wrong word. And that's for all of those words in the English language that sound the same, but are typed differently and mean completely different things, right? There's hundreds of them. The most famous one is probably there, there, and there, right? But there's also like deer and deer and meat and meat and board and board and two and two and two. There's three of those. And it's and it's, right? So that's what the blue squiggly's for. It's supposed to find those and alert you to the, it, the fact that there might be an issue there. Okay? Now you've got to remember through this whole thing, computers are dumb as a brick. They are a machine. They do not learn. They are not smart. They're just exceptionally fast. Okay, all they do is really, really fast calculations. So let's look at this paragraph down here now. I hope you haven't worked too far ahead because this part's kind of important. Before you get rolling on this paragraph, you should know that this word right here, Courtney, and that word right there, fudgy, are totally spelled correctly. They're absolutely right. So why do they have a red squiggly underneath them? See, this goes to how computers actually check spelling. The computer did not go to third grade and have spelling lists that they took home and their mom put on the fridge and spelling tests and all of that kind of crap that we all did when we were in third, second, third, and fourth grade. Because we learn. Computers do not learn. Not yet anyways. Okay, so how does a computer check spelling? It's absolutely so simple. You, you, you can't even imagine it's so simple. How does it check spelling? It uses a dictionary that's loaded into its memory right now. That's part of like when you open up Microsoft Word and you have to wait for it for a second, that's part of what it's doing. It's loading that dictionary into its memory off of the hard drive. Now, how it checks spelling because it's dumb as a brick, but it's super fast. Every time you type a word and you hit space, the computer assumes you're done with that word, right? Because spaces go between words, right? As soon as you hit space, it checks the entire dictionary to see if that word's in there. If what you just typed is in the dictionary, it leaves it alone. If what you just typed is not in the dictionary, it puts a red squiggly underneath it. So technically, why is that word right there, Courtney, got a red squiggly underneath it? Because it's not in the computer's dictionary. It checked the entire dictionary, didn't find it, so it red squiggly it. It doesn't give a crap if that's a name or a word or it doesn't even matter. It doesn't care. It just didn't find that pattern in the dictionary. So it squiggly it. Now, why is that important? Here's why. And I know you guys probably haven't run into this too much yet, but you will. If you go in to be trained to do anything specialty, which I'm hoping you will. It doesn't matter whether you go to college, whether you go to trade school, whether you learn how to be an engineer or a technician or an electrician or a welder, it doesn't matter. Teacher, it doesn't matter. All of those professions use their own language, right? Now, the dictionary that's loaded into the, to the computer by default for your phone and for like the word processor is what they call a conversational English dictionary. That means it's the general words you would find in normal conversations. So if you go to, to school to be a welder and you start typing up papers on welding, you're going to end up with a lot of words that are red squigglied that are totally spelled right just because they're not in the conversational dictionary. You can, in fact, go online and download supplemental dictionaries, like if you're going into medicine, you can download a supplemental dictionary for medical terms. You can load it into your computer. You can go into your word processing options and show it where it is and it loads it in. And then every time you type a word, the computer checks two dictionaries as fast as you can type. If it finds the word in one of those dictionaries, it leaves it alone. If it doesn't, it marks with a red squiggly. It's so simple. 
But in order to do something like that, you would have to be blazing fast, which a computer is, right? If you end up being a lawyer, you're going to download legal terms, load those in. If you end up being, you know, anything, a teacher, we've got words that we use all the time that this is going to red squiggly. Does that make sense? That's kind of how that works. So if this red squiggly on this word Courtney that you know is right, but the red squiggly drives you insane, you can't just ignore it yourself, what can you do with it? You could add it to your dictionary, don't add it to my dictionary. You could add it to your own dictionary at home, or you can tell the computer to ignore it. Now, when would you add it to the dictionary versus when would you ignore it? What's the difference? If it's, if it's something you're gonna use a lot, like if it's, if it's a, even slang terms that you've got with your friends, you can add to your dictionary on your cell phone too. Like if you keep typing in a word that you and your friends use all the time and it keeps squiggly in it, add that sucker to your dictionary. It'll leave it alone. Okay, but like this Courtney, what, what if this was your mom's name or your sister's name or your name, your grandma's name? Like you're gonna see that again. And wouldn't you like the computer to help you catch it if you typo somebody's name that you use all the time? Probably. So if you added that to the dictionary, then it would catch it in the future if you mistyped it. I know you wouldn't misspell it on purpose, but if you mistyped it, because you got fat fingers like me and you double strike all the time, um, you could the computer would help you fix that. But in this case right here, fudgy, like first of all, that's a real word. Fudgy is spelled with a Y instead of an IE. It means chocolatey and delicious, right? Or fudge-like. So why would you add a misspelled word to your dictionary on purpose especially when this is a class pet hamster that you're never going to see again. So in that case, you definitely want to ignore it. Okay, anyways, you go through this, clean this up. <clears throat> Notice as you're cleaning this up, this is interesting. If you right click on school to do the cleanup, notice the computer has no idea what word that's supposed to be. All it does is give you a bunch of choices. Your cell phone does the same thing, right? Computers are stupid. They are waiting for you to tell it which one of those is the right word, even though the right word is friggin' obvious. Right? Which makes it it's, makes me crazy that you've got the, some of the best technology we've ever come up with sitting in front of you on the desk or in your pocket, and you still have to know how to spell. You can't get around that. You still have to pay attention in English. As weird as that sounds. Kind of weird, huh? Anyway, I was going to ignore fudgy. Some spaces are missing. All right, now here's something else about proofreading. How many people's computers caught this word right here? Anybody's got a blue squig underneath that? Like I do? No? Should it have a blue squiggly underneath it? Yes, because it's the wrong word. Even though it's spelled right, it's the wrong word. It means the computer's dumb as a brick and you have to still proofread your work. I mean, the same thing on your cell phone. Does it catch everything or do you end up looking like a fool? Right. This should be T-H-E-R-E, -E, right? And now don't fall into this trap either. Now there's no squigglies. Is that perfect now? You turn that into Pat or your English teacher? Are they going to love it or are they going to bust your chops? So what's wrong with it? This is the wrong R. It should be our which is funny because if people said that right, they probably would spell it right. That's our class pet hamster. Now it's perfect, right? This one's kind of funny, I think. I've never seen a computer catch this one. That word right there is the wrong word. That says Courtney hoped on the school bus excited to get to school. Doesn't make any sense. It does if you turn that into hopped on the school bus excited to get to school. You still gotta know spelling. You still gotta proofread your work. You still gotta know your grammar. 
the best technology we've come up with and it still can't get it done. Next, we are going to insert some clip art in this one, except this program doesn't call it clip art. A lot of programs still do, so I keep the word clip art in there. This program calls it an online image. So to do it, you'd put your cursor where you want the image to show up. You would go up here to insert and you would go to online pictures. So I don't know, search for something interesting, slap it in there. All you do is click it and click insert or you can double click the picture, it'll put it right in there. Okay, now next picture, this is a different kind of picture. Now I know they look the same when you get them in your worksheet, but the second picture, this is if you wanted to insert a picture that you already owned. Like I've already got it on the hard drive or I've emailed it to myself or I took the picture on my phone or whatever and I want to put that in a document. Now yes, on this one you can just drag and drop. But officially, you would go to insert pictures and it opens up this explorer window for you to go find the picture on your hard drive. Now, the picture you're looking for, I hid in the teacher materials. We're all doing the same picture on this one. So maneuver over to the teacher materials into my business office folder. There's an owl in there. He looks like that. That's the one you're looking for. And he's pretty big. So a lot of times I shrink him, shrink him down a little bit. There he is. A couple things about pictures before we move on, because I know a lot of people, pictures in the word processor, the pictures upset people sometimes. And here's why. This picture right now, by default, is inserted in a format that's called inline with text. And what that means is that the computer sees the picture as text. So it treats it like a word. For instance, if I wanted to move this picture to the center, I can't just grab it and drag it to the center. It won't work. But if I want to put it in the center, I have to treat it like a word. So I could actually go to my home ribbon and click the center button. It would put it in the center. Now, there's a way around that. I can make this picture a free agent so I can put it anywhere I want. To do that, with the picture you know, highlighted, you have a toolbar up here called Picture Formatting Toolbar, right? Picture Tools Format, click that. Over here on your text, there's a text wrapping button. See that text wrapping button? Open that up and put it either behind text or in front of text. Doesn't matter, just pick one. Depends on where you want it. Now, if you grab that picture and move it around, you put it anywhere you want. And if you select it in front of text, it will actually block the text. If you select it behind text, the text will actually show on top of the picture. Those options are also right here in this little pop-out, but they don't actually say which is which, which is why I went the other direction. So you kind of have to know what you're looking at to use that. Okay, so there I have it. I put it behind text. So now the text shows up in front of it. And it gives you these like green guidelines that helps you put the picture kind of in the center and whatever, right? Now, also in this picture tools formatting toolbar, you have a bunch of different options. So if you want to mess with the picture, uh, you could do that. Like I can change it to look like kind of a tile. I can go, I can change its color, make it look kind of old, maybe washed out a little bit. Okay, pretty cool. Maybe you guys knew all that already. I don't know. Can be pretty useful though. Next section. Now, this part comes with a little FYI, almost a warning. To get this worksheet to do what I wanted it to do so that everybody's looks the same, so that you can tell if you're doing it right or wrong, I had to in include a bunch of invisible formatting. You cannot see the formatting, it's invisible, but you can delete it if you're twitchy with the backspace key. The killer is that if you delete the formatting that's invisible, I don't know which part of it you deleted because you can't see it. It's invisible, which means that I can't fix it, which means that you may, in fact, destroy this part of the worksheet and it won't work right for you like for the rest of the time. Okay, so please follow directions. Don't get twitchy with the backspace key. We're going to do this step by step so people don't get confused, so everybody looks the same, 
So it looks fantastic. Trust me, being able to create an outline on a word processor is pretty useful. So to start this out, I'm gonna go straight across from main idea. See where the name main idea number one is right there? I'm gonna go straight across right out into here and I'm gonna click to put my cursor out there. And it should end up right on that line, right underneath the I and it. Now, to get into the numbering system, you can in fact just start typing numbers. That works, but it's not as good as letting the computer take care of it for you. So what I would suggest is go up here into the paragraph section if you want to do a numbered list and see where the numbering is right here. Just turn that on. Don't open it up. Don't change the numbering format. Just turn it on. It should give you a one and a period and a space or an indent just like it did for me. Now I can tell you a couple of things about this outlining process. If you do this correctly, you should not even have to take your hands off the keyboard. There won't be any clicking or manipulating. It just does it. It's awesome. If you don't do this correctly, chances are the computer is going to fight you. And the computer is probably going to win. Because remember, it will not read your mind. All right, so start out. I'm going to show you how this works. Just type main idea and hit enter and watch what happens. Did it give you a two? Yes. Gave me a two as well. Is it two what we want? No, we want to increase the indent over to that A, but the computer doesn't know that yet. So while it's sitting here, what it's doing right now is it's sitting there waiting for instructions. What's going to happen next? If you just start typing, it'll just start putting words right there. But if you want it to increase the indent before you start typing, you hit the tab key. See that? And then I can type in my sub idea. I can hit enter. It gives me a B. I don't want a B. Before I start typing, I hit the tab key and it kicks it over to that Roman numeral one. And I can put in my supporting details. When you get down to here, I know you're not down here yet. But when you get down to here, just wait for a second. Don't get all twitchy. Don't start pan pounding on the backspace key. Just wait for a second so we can get some people caught up. If you end up out of your numbering system, like you end up like over here. See how I'm back over here? I'm totally out of the system. This is how you get back in. You just put your cursor at the end of the last line and hit enter and it jumps right back in the numbering system. You can tab over to increase the indent. You can put in your supporting details or whatever you got to put in. Now notice I'm waiting right here with the Roman numeral four because that has got to be there with the cursor sitting here blinking, waiting for instructions for any of this to work. So what I'm gonna do now is instead of increasing the indent, which takes it over to the right, I'm going to decrease the indent, which takes it over to the left. To do that, you hold down the shift key and hit tab. Bam, back over to the left, sub idea, enter, tab, supporting details. Now, when you get down to here, you should know, and this isn't like rocket science or anything, but you should know you can hit shift tab more than once. Okay, it doesn't care. You can shift tab all the way back to the beginning. I can tab all the way over here to the freaking right. It doesn't care. Shift tab all the way back. It'll do what I tell it to do. It just won't read my mind. Okay, so then I type second main idea. Enter, tab, I got a sub idea. Tab, got some supporting details. Shift tab, got a sub idea, got some supporting details. When you get to the very end and you've got this Roman numeral four staring you in the face right there, waiting for instructions, what you're gonna do, cause you're done listing, right? What you're gonna do is just go up to your paragraph section here and turn off the numbering. That is by far the best way to get out of the numbering scheme. Now, a couple of things about this. If I wanted to edit any of this, I can totally edit this. Like if I wanna come up here and change this word to something else, right, I can do that, not a big deal. If I wanna change the outline, so maybe this second main idea is not really a main idea, maybe it's a sub idea. You see what I did there? I put my cursor right between the auto-generated number and my typing right there, 
It's got to be right there. It won't do this. And then to increase the indent, I just hit the tab like normal. And notice what it did with the numbering. Now I've got A, B, C, D, and E instead of A, B, A, B. And if I tab it over again, now over here I've got Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, and 4, but here I've got A, B, C, and D. And over here in the main ideas, I've only got a 1. See how it, it, it and then I can shift tab this back if I want to. The trick is the cursor's got to be in the right place. Like if I wanted to move this over, I could shift tab this back over to, now I've got A, B, C, and I've only got one supporting detail and one and then three. If you do this right, the computer should handle all the numbering and the spacing and the indents and everything, and you just handle the typing. And you shouldn't even have to take your hands off the keyboard to do that. You should just be able to type. Now, I don't have the next part of this labeled independent practice, but this is pretty much what it is. One of the great uses for an outline is to pre-plan your writing. So down here, I have a plan or an outline to pre-plan a five paragraph essay on eating choices. To keep you from having to scroll down here and type it and scroll up here, I've got a trick. So come down here, put your cursor right there. See, I'm not right underneath it. I'm like one line down. Go up here, turn on your numbering system so you're ready to go. You should get a one and a period and a little indent right there. And then here's the trick. If you go to the view tab, right underneath where you just clicked on view is a button that says split. Click that. Now you have a split screen. So it's two views of the same document. Pretty slick, huh? You can even control and mouse wheel you can zoom one out or zoom one in, whatever you want to do. They're totally independent, but it's the same document. Okay, so basically you're just going to get some practice doing outlines by typing this. Uh, it's kind of long, sorry about that, but it's not a deal breaker. It's a really good example of pre-planning your writing. Um, if you look at it while you're typing, you think about it, you could totally write an essay off of this plan. You wouldn't even have to be, it wouldn't even be hard. Now, after this is a bulleted list that you're going to do too. It works the same. This is me just checking to make sure you know what you're doing. Except instead of turning on the numbers, you turn on the bullets, which is the button right next to the numbering button. It's right here, the bullets button.